Um, <clears throat> hi everyone. Um, so we're about if yeah two or five um, we're about to uh, start. So uh, today we are very honored to have uh, Professor John Fortin to join us and share his research on uh, using language models as stimulated uh, income agents uh, for social science research. And um, Professor Fortin's research uh, at MIT Sloan focuses on the intersection of um, labor economics, market design, and information system, and is particularly interested in improving the efficiency and equity of matching markets. So uh, 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 um, I'll leave the stage to Professor. Great. Okay. Thanks so much for having me. Um, I'm sure we're not the time we talked to you today. Um, so, probably like a lot of you, I'm like, low key obsessed with large language models and uh, like, what's the impact of generative AI on a whole bunch of different things. And when I, you know, started kind of playing around with it seriously, um, being an economist and someone who sort of focuses primarily on economic research, I was kind of naturally drawn to this question: like, what could you use these things for uh, to do economics? Kind of like a somewhat obvious question. And um, you know, as playing around with them for a bit, I kind of kind of came to this realization that maybe you could do something. Um, that sounds weird, but maybe after the fact isn't so weird, which is use these models as uh, experimental subjects in the kind of uh, games that economists have mostly undergraduates and labs play. Uh, but, you know, it, as you kind of started doing this, or I started doing this, it, it kind of raises these questions of like, what exactly can you learn from, from doing this? Kind of thing? And so this is this talk is really my attempt to answer that, that question. Um, you know, so there's, there's some of this, these slides are kind of things that you probably already know quite a bit about, but, um, you know, the basic idea here is that you've got this language model that's kind of trying to, um, you know, given a sequence of words, they predict the statistically most likely completion. I mean, you can do other things to them to kind of change around what they're trying to do, but, you know, if you write, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the Right, it really wants to finish that with chicken sandwich. No, it wants to finish it with the United States, right? It's like trying to kind of um, get to that point. Um, so, you know, you kind of have all seen this, this basic idea. These have become a lot more capable um, in, a, in a pretty short amount of time. I'm not going to be able to tell you anything about why that's true or, you know, what it means or where the technology is going. I'm very much in the kind of uh, practitioner user of this for for my own sort of purposes, um, and you know, sure enough, GPT 3.5 will finish that with United States of America, um, and you know, you can kind of just see how this uh, kind of progresses. I I am I am happy. I right? just kind of keeps wanting to sort of complete this uh, the sequence. So I'm going to skip this uh, because you already know what these things are. Let me just kind of give you, uh, if you're an economist or an economist adjacent, um, I'm going to give you a very like canned, simplistic view of how econ research unfolds, at least on the, the theory side of things. Um, you start with this maintained model of human behavior, where we're going to assume that people are uh, rational, that they can um, you know, see, you know, make predictions about the future, that the calculate very quickly, that they don't face constraints on their memory, um, and that they kind of can use this to kind of pursue some goal. Um, and then what you do is you take that maintained model of human behavior, and it, you put it in these new scenarios. Right? So uh, I'm a labor economist by training. So, you know, I take that homo economicus model and I say, all right, imagine that is the uh, someone who runs a firm. And they're trying to make decisions about workers to hire, right? what kind of wages they're going to pay, or uh, how they're going to make selection decisions over applicants or, or whatnot. Uh, and you kind of do the same thing on the worker side where you say, okay, I'm you know, going to rationally pursue uh, education and job opportunities and uh, you know, whatever I do uh, to try to maximize some objective function. And you know, I'm going to do it rationally 
and I'm not going to face constraints on computation or, or memory or things like that. Uh, and so a lot of different kind of subfields of econ take this, take that basic model and put it in these situations. Um, you know, finances, investor, trader, maybe the director of a firm, public economics is doing this with a government or a taxpayer, um, and so on. Then empirical research, which I'm not, I'm not a theorist, uh, mostly empirical research is, all right, well, what do actual people do? What do actual firms do? Um, how much does that kind of match our theory of uh, what, what we think would happen? And so then there's just kind of this iterative process where you say, oh, well, you know, we tested this theory um, and, you know, it does, it's not quite right. And so we have to kind of change something about the, uh, the kind of the scenario. Oh, um, you say rationally received that means, is that like more of an, an ideal for what one of our just or what we do, or is that something that like has to make sure that if you imagine that the criminal part of the even like doesn't make any So, so the, you know, where people kind of like have like scratch at the, uh, the, the kind of this main theme of assumption is behavioral economics, where you say, well, you know what, people uh, actually seem to be present bias, or people seem to underweight small probabilities, or people seem to, um, you know, be subject to certain like biases about framing. And so it's not that empirical work does go after this kind of like basic assumption. But most, um, I would say most research in econ is still sort of in this like tradition of, we're going to assume that people rationally pursue their objectives. Rationality, uh, you know, I mean, we, we could talk about this for, for hours on end. I think the, the, what economists usually mean by this is um, pursues some objective in some sort of like systematic way. And try, try not to like load it with too much other about like is this like normatively the right way to play this game or something. Just that people you can kind of they will do things um, to pursue their objectives. The the problem with this program is it's very very easy actually to write a model more complicated than you can solve. Uh, you know, especially if you start kind of doing anything about say like expectations and beliefs and learning. Um, if you've ever done any kind of like econ theory, this kind of gets really gnarly, really fast. And so it's been kind of a limit on uh, how how you can do this sort of theory research. Okay, so the the idea here, this paper is, you know, at, at first I was like, well, we can make these experimental subjects. This is really like empirical work. And playing around for a bit, I, I don't think that's true anymore. I don't really think you should think of it as empirical work. It's more like a sophisticated simulation. Um, but the simulation is, is sort of similar to this like research paradigm in, in economics, where instead of this maintained model of human behavior, right, it's a computational model of human behavior. So that, you know, to the extent it's like manifested in, in text, right? And so rather than say it's going to rationally pursue objectives or any of these things that are, are um, kind of these maintained assumptions, instead we'll say it's going to do whatever the model says it's going to do, right? That's that will be our engine of behavior, not solving the first order condition and maximizing some objective function. Um, and then what you can do is you can put it in exciting new scenarios, right? So uh, let me imagine taking this uh, large language model and give it a scenario where you're an employer and you're deciding between employees and you're making trade-offs between their, their attributes. You know, so rather than trying to write that out as a, um, you know, like, let me give you, you know, I'll set all the conditions, I can kind of describe the scenario and then see what the model does. Notice that this doesn't really touch empirical research. My, my claim is that you'd still need to go out and see the real people act. Right? But being able to do this might be, uh, I think, a powerful engine for uh, coming up with new theory, for sort of exploring behavior through simulation, and then kind of going back to the field or the lab or, or data sets to actually, you know, see if this is, this is played out. Yeah, maybe to give me a little bit of like the devil's advocate here. Devil away. <laughs> 
to like some people would say that because these models are like just predictive models of effects, like they're actually they're not computational models of any human. How would you like? Well, I mean, I think one one argument is like the proof of the pudding is in the eating, yeah. right? Like if you can simulate behaviors, ideally that you don't have that you know it's not sort of in the training set, you know, it has to sort of memorize some classic result. But you can find some behavior and then you could go and see if that actually holds in the lab or in the field. I think that would be kind of a compelling argument that it was good enough for your purpose. And I think that the, the, the kind of criticism. You know, the criticism of the Homo economicus model, in, in some ways, it's, 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 it's like it's an obviously false model of the world. This is not like, you know, no one ever is like, hmm, let me wake up and write out a bunch of first order conditions and try to solve. Like, no one thinks like that. It's just like a useful engine for uh, trying to make predictions about the social and economic world. So I think, kind of in a similar way, like, this is not a model of people, but is it useful enough to generate predictions that we could go past? And see? So that, that would be, uh, I mean, and I, let me just like a meta comment. So econ seminars tend to be very hostile. And so I'm, I'm like, <laughs> I'm very like used to people kind of jumping in and saying like, you're full of shit. So like, feel free to jump in and, uh, and say that. Uh, you know, one, one critique, you might say, hey, look, Hey, buddy, we've been doing simulations in social sciences for a long, long time. Um, you know, aren't these just agent-based models? Um, and I would say that, you know, if you've ever seen this, this is Tom Schelling's model of uh, uh, segregation and coin flips and people kind of in their neighborhoods. Very, very influential. Um, I would say that, yes, we have been doing simulations. I think the big difference is that we don't, as researchers, um, one of the things with ABMs is we get to kind of choose the rules. And with large language models, it's actually nice that we don't get to decide what sort of micro behavior is. Because I can tell you the criticism that people have of simulation based social science findings is typically like, hey, that's great. I don't know what particular rules you pick to get this sort of emergent behavior that's then that, that happening. I mean, I think like in principle, I could go read the code. It, it's hard for people to kind of understand, like, all right, let me, you know, here's a wall of Python. Let me sort of like see the bit that's actually like driving this kind of emergent behavior. This paper, I think, was it was influential because the micro rules are really, really simple. It's like you, you know, you look at your neighbor and you sort of make a decision if you're in the minority. The fact that with these large language models, unless one that you have yourself, you don't get to kind of decide the rules of behavior. I think that's actually a real plus, right? You're not, you're not both kind of designing the behavior and measuring the outcome. So, um, so this is all kind of like wind up. Let me just talk about um, a couple examples of using this approach with uh, kind of classic results, primarily from behavioral economics. Uh, I'll talk about some objections and limitations and then talk a bit about uh, future research. So uh, the first one I'm going to talk about is a fairness experiment. And this is from a, a really famous paper called uh, Fairness as a Constraint on Profit Seeking. And what they did, um, so Kahneman, Nash, and Thaler, kind of the front and back both won Nobel Prize. Uh, what they did in this paper is they created a bunch of scenarios, primarily around economic situations that were about like, was it okay to change prices? Was it okay to raise prices? Was it okay to like cut someone's wage in the context? You know, does it matter if sort of it's a new person filling the job or it's a person who already had the job? So they have like a whole bunch of these scenarios. And then they ask real people, was it, was it fair? Was it acceptable? Uh, the first example they give in the paper is this one. It says a hardware store has been selling uh, snow shovels for $15. The morning after a large snowstorm, the store raises the price to 20. Please rate this action as completely fair, acceptable, unfair, uh, very unfair. And you know this is uh, price damaging. 
and in some states it's it's illegal. Uh, you know, some economists are not fans of these kind of laws. They say, oh, you know, it messes with the price system. Um, but people have this very strong intuition that price gouging is essentially like you're taking advantage of people and stuff. And you know, maybe unsurprisingly, uh, eighty-two percent of the respondents in their study said it's some form of uh, unfair. How many people think it's unfair? Just out of curiosity. How many say go for it, hardware store capitalists? <laughs> well, you can do the same same thing. Present instead of your undergraduate at uh, probably the University of Chicago in the 1980s. Um, you can do this exact same prompt. Um, have it rate the action, and uh, we'll get the we'll get the return. We'll, uh, we'll see what it says. Well. You know, one thing I wanted to do, because this is programmable, I'm not kind of constrained to just their exact prompt. Um, I put in a couple of string interpolation things here I can do. I can slide in whatever the new price is. Uh, so, you know, instead of the $20, I can try 25 or 30 or whatnot. Uh, I also, I wondered if the word raises might have any effect on how the language model kind of responds to things. So I put in this possibility, like you can see this if neutral, I just have changes the price to, and otherwise it raises the price to. Um, and then the last thing I did, it's kind of a little trollish, is that you are a, and I could give it politics. I could say like, you're a libertarian, you're a socialist, you're uh, whatever. And then kind of can see how this possibly affects these judgments about um, fairness. And, you know, just kind of like stepping back when I kind of like told you, you know, broadly speaking, um, being okay with price gouging or price changes happening this way would be kind of coded as sort of right wing, right? And I think like being like, no, you should stop this, the market mechanism is trying to doing something unfair, would be somewhat coded as left wing. Left -wing. So that's why I kind of put in this politics, see if it kind of changed around the, um, the responses. Okay, um, so this, you know, I just started with the original, which is uh, price from $15 per shovel to $20 per shovel after the snowstorm. And uh, I also did 16, so just like a tiny little increase, 40 and, uh, and 100. And then this was the political orientations that I was talking about. So. We have socialists all the way to, to libertarians here. Not that you can like perfectly put these on a line, but that's the basic idea. And then these are just the judgments. Acceptable, unfair, very unfair. Um, I turned the temperature way, way down. Like I think the temperature is just zero here. Because I just wanted to kind of get what, what was sort of the most likely response um, in this case. And so you'll see, I, I kind of only get one observation per scenario because if you present the same thing, it's just going to kind of return the same same thing if the temperature is low. Uh, so let's start with our GPT-3 libertarian. Um, so they find a small increase acceptable. And this this is raises, this is changes. They both just stacked up on acceptable. So no, no problem. Uh, but, you know, even if you start to increase the price, eventually you get to the point where even the robot libertarian is like, no thanks, that, that's, it's unacceptable. Um, so, you know, you can kind of see this gradient with respect to how big the, the, the gouging is, though they never get to, to very unfair. Now, what if you prompt it with a different political orientation? Right, so our robot socialist slash leftists, um, you know, they're kind of unfair or very unfair across the board as the price gets larger, very unfair, uh, very unfair. I mean, I think um, GPT-4, it would be totally unsurprising that they're able to do this. GPT-3, I think that this was kind of surprising to me that like it was able to pick up on this nuance and map it to something like price changes. So this is, you know, what it was doing four or five months ago, uh, I think this would kind of be even less surprising now that it's able to do this. 
Um, One interesting thing that kind of pops out, and I, it's not that interesting, but I think it's a good example. If you look at conservatives and libertarians, there's actually a distinction. Like the conservatives kind of view it as unfair, unfair, even though the uh, moderates and the libertarians say it's acceptable. Now, this may be just like an artifact of the language model where the word like conservative means like I don't like change and I'm going to like choose some negative sentiment to change. Or maybe there is something kind of political, there is something real here. Like it's a conservative might, um, you know, kind of be a not just like a free market type, but kind of like I like things to stay the way they are and like, you know, um, a, a different kind of conservative. I don't actually care about snow shovels and pricing or like political orientation. My point just being that if there was something here that you discovered through simulation, maybe you could go see if this kind of thing holds with real people, right? You could go do a survey and is there something to this? Is there some kind of difference between being a conservative or a libertarian when it comes to the pricing? The idea being that this kind of simulation approach, which takes seconds and costs pennies, could be generative for research that you might go and do actually. You know, and then you can kind of go see, is there actually something to this? Um, any questions before I go on to the to another experiment? Um, yeah, is it the, um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm losing my voice, but isn't the, um, the true libertarian view here that um, it's up to the store to set the price however they want and that perhaps a very high price is actually an indication that the store just does not want to give up the shovels because the uh the model i guess is not able to like make that sort of uh you know that sort of extrapolation well i mean I, you know i didn't really give the model it, like its chance to really elaborate and say like why it sort of viewed that so I, I i that's a good it's a good question because you could imagine doing this where you also say all right, give me your answer. And then you could go explain your reasoning or talk through step by step or what's your argument. So then we can kind of see if, uh, you know, if I make a robot libertarian, is it parrot back sort of libertarian type rationale for its decision? So, you know, I, you know, I don't know why it said unfair. I don't know why it was sort of influenced by the price, but I could imagine you can kind of do sort of qualitative research with these responses in the same way and actually can get a lot of a lot of insight that you know frankly would be kind of hard to do with human subjects. I don't know if it, many of you have done kind of experiments with like online subjects and trying to do things on MPERT or whatnot. You know, you kind of have a kind of a narrow window to like ask like long detailed questions. Your your large language model friends will go for the rest of <laughs> the rest of the time answering your, your questions if you want to pose them. So, um, you know, that may be an approach to, I think, that could enrich the sort of thing. Getting into reason. Yeah. You could, you certainly could. And, you know, I think one of the things, um, I'm going to just stop this for one second. Right, let me just break out of um, it's not in the slideshow, but I want to just, um, I may regret doing this if it breaks the, uh, the plus, if you want to open it, you can... yeah. Okay. There we go. Did I spell my own name, right? I can't really see. Yeah. Um, Put this in the recent version of the paper, but you know, you might kind of say, well, um, there's a somewhat unrelated issue, which is like how much is this sort of like memorizing um, uh, these these experiments? Because we've read the paper in the form of it probably is, and so. Uh, but, but to your question about temperature, so, you know, here's the a hardware store has been selling snow shovels for 15 the morning after a large snowstorm, the storm raises the price to, and you can see 20 um, is the most common choice. So you kind of be like, ooh, you know what, maybe it's, maybe it's kind of memorized things, right? Um, of 
clothing boutique has been selling brooches for $15. The morning after a large explosion at the brooch factory, the store raises the price to $20 is still the most common. Um, a hamburger joint has been selling hamburgers for $15. The morning after mad cow disease is discovered, the store raises the price to $20. It's the same, it's, it's, even, it's even slightly higher. Um, what, I, what I think is going on here is that uh, 15 to 20 is just kind of like a natural increase. Like you wouldn't raise prices from like 15 to 15.1. Like humans have kind of a bias towards numbers that are divisible by five. So I think this pattern is not so much about memorization uh, of, the, of, of a training example. It's that this 15 to 20 is very, very common. But to your question about temperature, what you can do is if you crank the temperature up, I mean, this is in the prompts, but I mean, presumably you'd get this like distribution over, over answers if you started increasing the, the temperature. I think, you know, for my purposes, it's, it's kind of noise. I want to see sort of like what's the, the modal what, what, what's going to be the most common response? But I think um, I think how you should do this in practice is try a bunch of different temperatures, try a bunch of different models, and, and also try perturbing your prompts in a way to see sort of like how sensitive are results to like precise work. You know, so you could, I mean, you can imagine, you know, at least with GPT-4, taking my hardware store example and say, give me another example of this scenario, but in a different industry, right? And you, know, you can kind of programmatically generate a whole bunch of examples that have the same basic like structure as your original experiment and test it all on that. It, it'd be like super, super cheap and easy to do. So, you know, that's probably something people uh, should do. Yep. This one. Did I screw this up completely? Oh, really? Ah, thank you. Um, okay, so let me talk about a different kind of experiment. You know, so uh, one of the kind of, uh, kind of almost like cartoonish version of that rational model is that oh, people are just like very, very entirely self-interested and never help anyone else. Um, you know, if it costs, you know, me even a dollar to, to give you a hundred dollars, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it. Um, and that's, that's not true. People, people show uh, uh, what economists call social preferences. Like they care about the outcomes of, of other people. Um, and there's a very, very well-known paper by Gary Charnas and Matt Raven, where among other things, they took undergraduates Berkeley and Barcelona, and gave them these scenarios, which uh, are kind of called dictator games, where you know I have to kind of decide how much money to give to another person. Like I'm giving a hundred dollars, I'm giving a hundred dollars, and I have to like split it with to decide do I give it 50 50 or you know 30 60 or whatever or 30 70. <laughs> um, the the scenarios that they give were not sort of free form. What they said is, here's one allocation of money, and here's another allocation of money, right? Like that one, one possible split or another possible split, and then I have to decide which one I prefer. Uh, and it, it, the, the game is like so. Like you imagine that you're, you have a person A um, and a person B, and um, Person A for something. Give me another another inch. <laughs> so this would be like this would be person A's payoff, right? And this is person B's payoff. So in this one, we both get four hundred, right? That's playing left, right? That's like you choose the left choice. You can also choose the right choice, where again you're player B, you get four hundred. But your opponent gets 750. Not opponent, that's the wrong way to frame it. The other person, player A, gets 750. So um, anyone, what would be the logic? Why would you ever why would you ever play anything other than right here? Fair mean person. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's the more positive framing of that? 
you, you don't like inequality, right? Like th this is like this is the future Jeff Bezos, and you're like, how would that? Like everyone's getting four hundred, right? So you know that it's not a crazy idea that you might you know dislike um, dislike inequality. That being said, uh, only about thirty percent of undergraduates played last year. About seventy percent of the people said, no, you know, I want to expand uh, expand the pie, um, and so. 70% of the people played right. Um, you know, here's just another one. Right. In this one, this one's pretty funny. Um, you know, you take and you get yourself 800. The other person gets nothing. Or, you know, you both get 400. Here, you know, score one for the like rational. I, uh, you know, almost 80% of the people here choose left. So they, they kind of take the big payoff and the other person, uh, you know, gets nothing. So, you know, these scenarios, what they're, what they're designed to do is kind of create these trade-offs um, between like, oh, thank you. Uh, you know, trying to create these trade-offs between um, self-interest, efficiency, and inequality. They're, they're trying to like put these in tension. I think with, with the different scenarios, um, like some, like you maximize the pie, but people kind of get an unequal allocation or some, like you get a really high personal payoff, but like the whole, everyone else kind of suffers. So that, that's what they were kind of probing with this. Um, and you know, this is, you can kind of see the only one where people, everyone is sort of aligned is uh, no one, no one chooses this. Like here, you would get 200, the other person would get 800. Or you both get nothing. No one plays this sort of like very very spiteful uh, play. Okay, so let's do it with GPT three agents. Um, again, you can give them these scenarios. I think I actually have a have a typo in the instructions, but it's just basically a description of this. You know, would you choose left or right? Um, as you probably if you've played around with these, you kind of. I have to try to get him to be not so chatty. You know, just tell me left or right. But um, and what I what I also did though, uh, you get the scenario, but then I also gave it a, a personality, and I'll, I'll describe what that means. It's kind of like the political orientation thing. But I wanted to see, like I said, these these scenarios are about trade offs between inefficiency and inequality, um, and like person like self interest. So I wanted to give it personalities and say, hey, you know, you only care about yourself, or you know, you really care about equality. And to see if the model is capable of picking up that kind of personality and changing how it how it plays. So these are the what I would call like the endowed personalities. So you know you only care about fairness between players, you only care about the total payoff, you only care about your own pay. So it's just, it, it, you know, this is kind of an open question. Like could it map these kind of high level descriptions of your motivation to, to gameplay. And here, one thing I did that's, that's separate, I, um, you know, here I actually kind of played around with the, uh, the model or, you know, so this is the prompt, but then the actual model, uh, you know, you can pass it, pass it different models. And that's going to actually be important here. So, this kind of mirrors what I had done earlier, except this is going to be people playing left, people playing right. And then that's the Charnas and Raven population. This is going to be the blank personality, fairness, efficiency, and, and selfish. And then, uh, so this is, you already saw this, but this is just what, what, his popul what their population of humans did. And then at the time, I wrote this, this was with DaVinci 003, the most uh, advanced model that I could get my hands on. Um, and then, but I also tried it with less advanced GPT-3 models, Ada, Babbage, and, and Curry. So let's look at the simple GPT-3 models. You can see they're, they're almost entirely, well, except for this, but they just don't alter their play. They just always choose left. Um, there's no variation. 
Uh, they don't, it doesn't seem to be sensitive to the endowment. The only difference is without any endowment at all, um, two of the three models play left and one third plays right, which is really like there's nothing kind of going on here. Are these the models that have the RLHS students? No, they are not. So now let's look at what GPT-3 Da Vinci does, um, which I think has had that human feedback, but I'm not, I'm not totally sure. Um, so it's a little, little hard to parse, but like take that fairness persona. If you look at um, the choices that it makes, it, um, I have a typo here, but what it does is it always chooses the option that minimizes the difference between the two, um, with that one exception of, of the, the 800 versus 200 choice. Um, the blank persona and the efficient persona, in both of those cases, you can see it's all lined up on right. Um, it always chooses the option that maximizes total payoffs. So it's able to follow that idea that you know you only care about total payoff. Uh, you know I don't know why the blank one also plays this way, but that's just what it does. And then if you kind of give it the last one, the selfish persona, um, it always just chooses the option to maximize its own payoff. Um, and so the, you know the only one you can see the top one where it's four hundred seven fifty, it chooses the non spiteful thing. But otherwise, it always just picks the one that maximizes its own own payoff. So, you know, I just to, to, to just pause for a minute here. Um, you know, if you're if you're trying to think about your own research, like what do you think is surprising? Um, this surprise, I, I kind of like when I was designing these, I, I thought this was the one that would fall down on. That this would be you kind, of, you kind of have to like map this kind of idea of social preferences to like how you play these these games um this one was i was i was surprised that it did this okay let me talk about um a framing experiment so a lot of the behavioral econ stuff is focused on how the same exact scenario framed differently uh can drive different behaviors so sometimes things that um or the, the whole like the prospect theory literature about like framing some things as gains versus losses. Uh, one example of this is what's been called status quo bias. That basically when you frame something as the status quo, uh, people tend to put more weight on it. It's arguable that that is a behavioral bias as opposed to um, maybe a useful heuristic. Like if you think things kind of exist as a status quo for some reason, but, uh, you know, put that, put that aside. Um, you know, the question, the, 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 so this paper, what they do is they give a bunch of scenarios where they take these decision scenarios, they get people's preferences, and then they also frame, um, they give the same decision scenario, but one of the options is framed as the status quo, and they sort of measure how much that sort of shifts people's uh, preferences. So this is the, the example they use in the paper. It says the National Highway Safety Commission is deciding how to allocate its budget between two safety research programs, improving automobile safety and improving the safety of interstate highways. Um, and so that's that was the, the scenario. And what, what they were actually prompted was to choose their most preferred funding allocation. So you can say, I want the budget to go 70 to cars, 30 to highway, 40 to cars, 60 to highway, uh, and so on. That was the, the basic framing. Um, and then the central experimental manipulation in the paper is to present these funding breakdowns either neutral, neutrally, or relative to some status quo. So you could just say neutral was, you know, what funding level for car safety do you want? Right, that would just be Right. Or I could say the funding is currently at 25% for cars. If this was their true preference, they really wanted 50%, and you told them the status quo was 25%, but that status quo didn't mean anything, they'd say, oh, I wanted to raise it by 25%. Yeah. Um, but if a person has status quo bias, 
they might prefer 50% but stick with 25%. But that, that's, the, that's the basic idea. Now, here's one, to do this one, um, you actually need to induce variation in, in preferences. Now, like, you could do this with, um, I think you could do this with temperature, but I wanted to kind of give it uh, like a natural a natural distribution of preferences to kind of like match what people might have in real life. And then fixing those preferences so to see how the status, how the presentation of the status quo changes their decision making. So what I would give it in the prompts is things like option one safety is the most important thing, or option one could be cars or, or hiring. Um, you know, blank safety is a terrible waste of money. We should only fund blank safety. So you can slide these in and out to kind of create people with preferences. And then with that prompt, then I can go and ask uh, what do people, what do the model actually think? So this was the, the neutral framing. Uh, this is just the distribution when, uh, you know, in, in this, don't take too much stock in this. I mean, this is just the preferences I gave it with my simulated examples. Uh, what's really going to matter is how does this, how do these responses change from this distribution to these other distributions when I change things as the status Changes the what's the status quo. So in this one, you know, thirty percent auto is framed as the status quo. Fifty percent auto is the status quo. Sixty, seventy, uh, so on. And so what I've done here is the option in red is that was when it was framed as the status quo. So this is what the the distribution of agent responses. Um, I think the the pattern here is is pretty clear when you put. When you frame it as the status quo, you get a lot more of the agent saying, this is what I would, I would prefer. Even in the, um, in one look at, I mean, this one's kind of surprising, right? You have almost 60% of people say they prefer 60% car, 40% um, highway, and no one, I'm trying not to anthropomorphize, <laughs> say no one, it's a little bit hard. Um, none of the agents sort of said that when it was presented this way. Okay, so, um, you know, stepping back, what did we learn? Well, the slide's out of date, but the most advanced LOMs created agents that respond to these social science scenarios, I would say in realistic. I would not say that this is like, oh, I confirmed these experimental results here. I'm just saying that using our kind of common sense knowledge of the social world, these responses, like they're not crazy. This is kind of like what you might expect to happen if you did this with real people. Um, I, I'm gonna make the observation that it's trivial to try variation in language, parameters, framing, all these things that in a conventional lab that you wanted to do would get expensive really fast. Like, like if you had a hundred subjects and you know you had say three different things you wanted to try, and each one had three levels. You know you're talking about increasing your sample size by you know a factor of, of twenty seven, right? Um, oh, and you know just like humans, the language and the framing of some of these things uh, seems seems to matter quite a bit. Um, okay, so what are some you know social science objections to this, or what you know what are what are some kind of like things you might be thinking about. Um, you know, one critique is none of this is that surprising because the models have read our papers and they're acting in accordance with the findings from our papers. I would say first, this is a very flattering view of acting. <laughs> that like we're so influential that we're pinning down, um, you know, how, how these models respond. But I think on the face of it, I, I don't think that that's very likely. But I think it would also, you know, it would represent a really remarkable degree of transfer learning. Like take the, the status quo bias one. Like you would have to assume that the model had read that paper, incorporated the idea of status quo bias, recognized that this was a scenario where uh, status quo bias would influence behavior. And then I, would, I think a much more plausible Occam's razor kind of answer here is, 
humans are in fact subject to status quo bias in this massive training corpus there's lots of examples of people reasoning about things and showing a preference for social for, for the status quo and it, it, it's reflected back in the models that, i think that's to me that's the more likely explanation um but you know can i prove that that's that's a, a little bit a little bit harder I'll talk more about what I think you need to do to prove that. But, um, this, I just also want to kind of flag the same concern actually arises in the social sciences more generally. There's there's like a little literature on like undergraduates getting econ education and then like acting in a more selfish way. Right? And so the idea that uh, you know maybe your theories in the social sciences influence behavior, which in turn would, sort of like, would uh, show up is, is maybe not, not so far-fetched, but so it, it's almost like it's a critique that would apply to lab experiments as, as well. Um, you know, sometimes you hear people would say, well, you know, garbage in, garbage out, um, you know, or, Maybe more charitably, the training corpus is not representative of humans. So what, what can we learn from that? Well, you know, I, I think that this is probably this is like certainly true, but it's probably irrelevant for most purposes. And I, I think one of the things that maybe not pretty well known, but it, it's wrong to think of these as like average opinions. Right? Because you, what you can do is you can very easily condition it to get something else that's not just the, the average. So, you know, if I say complete the following as if you're GPT-3, I'm from France and my favorite city is Paris. Um, okay, but if I say I'm from Belgium, it's like, well, immediately I say, all right, well, I've decided that given this other information, you have to this is kind of your answer. And so I think, you know, I think the so what from this is, even if you think there's lots of like unrealistic you know, stuff in the training corpus that shouldn't be there, for, for the purpose of running experiments, to what extent can we just kind of condition around this stuff, right? And say, you know, okay, you're an employer who runs a fast food restaurant and you're making decisions about hiring. Is that good enough to get a model of how people make decisions in that context useful for our, our purposes? Even if the corpus itself has like almost no one making those kind of decisions or there's lots of observations that, you know, or examples that sort of don't help us with this, um, we can kind of deal with it. Yeah, just more examples of this conditioning, not averaging. Okay, so, you know, what are the potential uses for these kind of experiments? I, I think the killer one, like the, the most useful thing is probably um, this engine for idea generation, right? That, if you say you're trying to do some social science, if you're interested in some topic, um, you can go and create that scenario by writing out prompts, um, maybe taking and having agents interacting with each other, and simulate that social uh, thing that you're interested in. So, you know, I'm a labor economist. Um, you know, I'm, I'm interested in lots of things, but I'm interested in like how people decide which jobs to apply. How they weigh off certain attributes. That data is not super easy to come by. You don't often get kind of data sets of people saying like this was my consideration set and these are the choices that I made. It's trivially easy to say, um, hey, you think before uh, create a persona for me, someone who works in tech, and then create these four job opportunities or job listings, and then have them kind of decide which one they're going to apply to and explain their reasoning. I can all do this sort of from the comfort of my, you know, my laptop and kind of play around and simulate some ideas and see if like, hey, maybe this phenomenon that I think or I, I conjecture might exist, if I can see it in Kiliko, can I then go to real data um, and actually try it out? And I, you know, I think that there's kind of this analogy to say doing um, you know, synthetic biology or, or, or uh, you know, trying to simulate proteins that you might be interested in in silico, see if they have the right, right properties. And if they do, then you try to synthesize them and see if they, they work out. And I mean, the advantage of this, like you can do this kind of simulation, you know, extremely cheaply. 
uh, you know, you're not, there's no IRB concerns. You have, you can kind of just, the, the, you have this kind of blank canvas to, to do things. Um, I think that maybe like a less exciting, but one that I would definitely do is just, uh, if you are planning an actual experiment, you could try, uh, try it first in simulation. So you could test the design, the language, you know, are, are your power assumptions reasonable? Um, it's you know very very easy to kind of try out some things. So you know a lot of surveys for field experiments is this worry that like the language might be driving responses. You know it's not the same as trying it out in real life, but you could try try out your stuff on these simulated agents first. Um, you know why might this work? Like why why might it be the case that you could try things out? In simulation, but then you would find you would find that to be true in the actual social world. Um, this is what I think uh, might be the case. So these models are trained on an enormous corpus of human generated text. Um, you know, qualitative social scientists often extract a lot of important insights from the text. Um, you know, we might think of these, the training corpus is sort of like natural qualitative research as opposed to design qualitative research. Like that, that those findings are kind of latent there in the text and we can then take and extract them uh, by creating simulations, creating scenarios, and then kind of drawing out those, those ideas. So, you know, take, so imagine that paper on status quo bias had never been written, right? If it's not if it's not just performativity and it's not just sort of memorizing the training corpus, you could run that experiment now, see that it matters, and then go and see if it's true in the real world. Like the, the idea being that status quo bias as a concept was latent in the text, but you just had to unearth it. Now, unfortunately, like I've got the timing wrong, right? Like the paper was written in the past and I'm sort of showing it now. The ideal test would be to go find something that's true in the model, and then go and show that it's actually true in the real world. And I haven't done that, but I think that that's, to me, I think that would be the most compelling example. Like, show it in simulation, um, and then go see if it's true uh, in the real world. Thank you. <laughs>